um, I'm going to draw on my book uh, for the talk today, and which I'm happy to say has finally been published after much uh, ado in February. Um, and in this talk, uh, I'm going to focus on robots that are uh, being developed and used primarily in the context of residential elder care in Japan. But um, I hope that the relevance extends beyond residential care and also beyond the specific case of Japan um, to other places, including the UK, uh, that are looking to robots as a possible solution to their own care crises. Um, as you may have, have seen in recent years, there's been an explosion of interest uh, in the application of robots to care. And they've been presented as a technological solution to the uh, problems, quote unquote, uh, presented by aging populations in the global north. Uh, and above all, to the problem of care gaps caused by um, an increase in care needs and a lack of sufficient numbers of care workers. So the analysis uh, I'm going to present is grounded in empirical data collected during ethnographic fieldwork that I conducted in Japan, um, mainly between 2016 and 2018 during my PhD. Uh, but I also want to um, take a step back and consider some broader questions. Uh, what is the nature of the care crisis in Japan? Um, what kind of solution to care crises are robots? Um, what would a future with care robots require? And what alternative visions for the future of care might surface through the very process of roboticization? So first, I'll just very briefly define exactly what I mean by care robots. So my PhD research uh, focused on a particular project, which was the Ministry of the Economy, Trade and Industries, 12.5 uh, billion yen, or around, at the time, $125 million uh, project that lasted from 2013 to 2017, called uh, the Project for the Development and Promotion of the Introduction of Robot Care Devices. Um, all of these projects have very long and kind of boring names, but um, uh, this was the, the kind of the world's largest uh, care robot project to date in terms of the amount of money for a single project and also the kind of ambition of the project. Um, it supported uh, the development and implementation of eight different uh, categories of care robots. So these included monitoring systems that use cameras or sensors to automatically detect, for instance, if somebody got out of bed at night unexpectedly or if they fall over. Um, an alert a caregiver. Um, also transfer aids uh, worn by a caregiver to help them lift a care recipient into or out of their bed or wheelchair. Uh, Non-wearable transfer aids, um, so um, something like uh, a robot arm for lifting the person. Uh, indoor and outdoor mobility aids <clears throat> and also toilet and bathing aids. Um, and not shown on this slide, uh, there's um, a ninth category of communication robots that was later added, which included devices like uh, the seal-shaped robot Paddle, uh, SoftBank Robotics Humanoid Pepper, and other so-called social or socially assistive robots. Um, and this project was led by the National Institute of Advanced Industrial Science and Technology, <clears throat> which is kind of like um, uh, a national research institute in Japan, one of the largest. Uh, and part of my field work in Japan involved spending three months uh, with the team at this institute, which is the um, acronym is ICED, uh, who were administering this project. And I'll come to that later. <coughs> so uh, the first question is, like, why is Japan trying to develop and implement these kinds of robots? And the answer on first sight is kind of blindingly obvious. Um, so I've got, um, there are a number of graphs which are kind of like always used in any presentation about care robots in Japan. Um, so this one is uh, a kind of classic, which shows just the demographics of Japan. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but it kind of shows the proportion of younger and older people changing over time since 1950 at the start of the scale to 2065 at the end. And we're kind of around here. 
So the population, the overall population has just peaked and it's starting to shrink. Um, and there's a larger proportion of older people aged over 65 and a smaller proportion of younger people. Um, in this slide, uh, we can see um, a near tripling in the number of older people who uh, require care uh, between 20, 2000 and 2020, um, and a near quadrupling of the number of uh, care workers employed since 2000. Uh, and finally, um, in this slide, uh, we have the estimated shortfall of care workers by 2023, 2025, and 2040. And here we can see this kind of widening gap where the deficit of care workers appears to be increasing kind of almost exponentially. So together, these and similar graphs and charts uh, frame many people's understanding of Japan's crisis of care. Um, in fact, it almost acts as a kind of model care crisis for much of the rest of the global north. Uh, Japan is all, often presented almost as a kind of national identity, as either the oldest country in the world or the fastest aging country in the world, or both. Although actually, if you um, neither of those claims is necessarily true. So, for instance, the last time I checked, uh, Monaco had an older median age, South Korea had a faster aging population, and Hong Kong had a longer life expectancy. So, Japan is definitely has one of the oldest national population groups, but it's interesting that this claim of being the oldest is so frequently repeated and it's become such a powerful and effective framing for Japanese politics. And in our specific case, for the promotion of care robots and other advanced technologies. So the narrative that's presented alongside these kind of graphs is fairly straightforward. Um, and in, in many of the presentations uh, I've, I've been to, there's barely any commentary to accompany them. Uh, the graphs are sometimes almost presented as if they speak for themselves. Uh, you know, the population is projected to age, life expectancy is increased, the total fertility re rate remains well below replacement levels. As the population ages, more people require more care there are fewer young people to provide that care. And so care workers are naturally in short supply um, and you need something to fill the resulting care gap. Um, a seemingly natural and rather econometric relationship is posited between demographic aging, growing demand for care, a lack of available human care, and by implication, the need for and solution of non-human care in the form of technological innovation. In the case of Japan in particular, the form that this technological innovation should take is often presented as naturally robots based on generalizing and often uncritical assumptions about Japanese people's supposed acceptance of robots, uh, which in turn are often based on the invented tradition of Japan's robotic culture, vague assertions of an inherently techno-animist belief system, uh, and a popular imaginary of Japan as already, you know, living in this futuristic robotic society. And those are ideas and images that are bolstered by relentless media, corporate and state promotion of robots, um, not just by technology and robotics companies themselves, but also by um, very influential advertising giants like Dentsu, which is one of the largest advertising agencies in the world. Uh, which set up a robot promotion center in 2014. Uh, but there's a big but coming, <laughs> uh, which is that it's something of an inconvenient truth for this narrative that in actual fact, robots, at least as many people understand them, don't really feature in most people's daily lives or in elder care in Japan. So the Care Work Stabilization Center survey of over 9,000 elder care institutions in Japan um, showed that in 2019, only about 10% reported having introduced any care robot, uh, while a 2021 study in Japan by Ide and others uh, found that out of a sample of 444 people providing home care, only 2% had experience with a care robot. 
And there's other emerging evidence to suggest that um, robots that have been purchased by an elder care institution often end up being uh, used only for a short period of time before being locked away in a cupboard. Uh, and we'll get to some of the reasons why this might be later on. So I want to trouble the seemingly straightforward logical synthesis presented in these kind of slides, uh, which are so often marshaled to provide the common sense rationale and also the business case for the development and use of robots in the care of older adults, particularly in Japan, but also in Europe and also the UK. It's very much presented as a kind of logical slam dunk that's unquestionable and doesn't really require much further explanation. Um, so introducing or including these charts in presentations about care robots is a, an established ritual, um, but it's also important to ensure that we're actually reading them correctly. So for example, if we take this slide showing the lack of care workers, um, you know, the context for this is that uh, it's an exercise conducted by the Ministry of Health, Labour and Welfare, where every administrative um, district in Japan has to provide estimates of the care workforce that they expect to need in the future versus the number of care workers they'd have if nothing changed from the current scenario. Um, and then the, the ministry's updated long-term plan in theory takes into account um, the estimated shortfall and takes steps to address it. <clears throat> so the lower number here in the red line um, is what prefectures uh, which are the administrative districts in Japan say would happen if no action was taken. So it's not an estimate of the actual situation uh, in a given year. And I think that's a really significant difference because um, this graph essentially um, in 2017, they estimated that by 2025, the deficit would be 380,000. Um, in the 2018 estimate, that dropped to 337,000. And in the 2021 estimate, it's now dropped to um, 225,000. Um, and obviously, this is largely without the help of robots. Um, secondly, uh, you, um, people using these charts often don't explain the deeper political roots of the current care crisis in Japan. Um, so most notable has been uh, the huge impact of the long-term care insurance system, uh, which was introduced in Japan in 2000, and that socialized the cost of elder care by, in part, um, in introducing a new tax for people aged over 40, um, and helps explain this rapid rise, apparently rapid rise in care needs and employment since then uh, that we saw in this chart. So 2000 is the year that that um, system was introduced. Um, it's sometimes uh, argued that care in Japan and in Asian, Asian countries more generally is rooted in this kind of Confucian culture that centers care by family. Um, and family care is very important in Japan, but as Yamato Reiko has demonstrated, um, expectations of care and mutual reliance between older Japanese people and their children has decreased as government welfare provision has increased. And this long-term care insurance system, LTCI in particular, um, has played a major role in flipping how responsibility for elder care uh, is publicly perceived from being the responsibility of the family primarily to being the responsibility of the state. And this had huge implications for care work that helped to explain this, these rapid increases in the chart. Um, LTCI introduced an assessment of formal care needs. So in fact, the, the actual correct label here is not the number of older adults requiring care, but the number of older adults formally assessed under LTCI as requiring care. Um, and the system also led to a rapid rise in the demand for uh, formerly employed care workers to address these needs, um, but also arguably a relative reduction in informal care provision by family and friends, um, particularly as more women have moved into work. Um, one of the incredible um, uh, things, which unfortunately I don't have it on a, a graph in these slides, is that since 2000, the overall 
size of the number of people of working age has decreased, but the number of people in work has increased over the same period. And that's largely because um, the female labor force participation rate has been rising steadily since 2000. Um, over the same period, there's been a big increase in the proportion of older people living alone, um, uh, which is also a connected trend. So part of the aim of LTCI was to free up all of these, you know, largely female informal carers um, so that they wouldn't have to care for their relatives and they could participate in the formal economy where their labor would become productive and counted in GDP figures. Um, but although, as we can see here, the number of formal care workers has risen continuously, uh, it hasn't been enough to offset the ongoing rise in assessed care needs, leading to this growing pressure on the care system. So in short, what we've seen over the past 20 years is this massive rebalancing of the labour and costs of care between public and private, formal and informal. Um, and one of the reasons why I'm going into a lot of detail on this is that um, I believe one of the inspirations for the new approach to funding adult social care in the UK is partly based on uh, LTCI in Japan. So another um, important element that's missing from this argument that's put forward um, for to support, you know, uh, care robots is the rapidly evolving migration situation in Japan. So the total number of foreign workers uh, in Japan pre-pandemic doubled from just over half a million in 2009 to 1 million in 2016, and then rose to 1.66 million uh, by 2019. Uh, in recent years, there's been significant, and I would say almost a, a desperate deregulation of migration channels by the Japanese government um, and for instance, they've introduced a new work visa program uh, with the aim of bringing in 345,000 new workers from China and Southeast Asia by 2025, including 60,000 care workers. Um, although that target hasn't been met in part because of um, COVID-19. Uh, and then there are other relevant, uh, highly relevant things that are missing in many of these charts. So. Um, most significantly, the poor paying conditions of care work, uh, which in Japan is typically paid at about minimum wage levels. Uh, and Glenda Roberts and Hiroko Costantini, uh, their recent work has looked at the introduction of new um, care work reconciliation policies to reduce the number of people dropping out of work in order to uh, care for a family member, um, although these have had limited uh, impact so far. So all of this is to suggest that the care crisis in Japan is more complex and dynamic than these charts alone might suggest. And it's certainly not as simple as being the natural consequence of demographic aging or a demographic lack of young people. Because, for example, if um, care work was better paid uh, and respected as a career, uh, more people would likely become care workers or if there were more effective um, policies in place to support informal carers or better social services, community support or housing options uh, for older people, there'd likely be less demand on formal care services. So the care crisis in Japan, like the care crises in the UK or other countries, isn't a natural or inevitable phenomenon, as is sometimes implicitly presented in crisis narratives used for the purpose of pushing robot uh, care solutions. Instead, you know, it's, as we know, it's the result of a series of specific political and economic choices, uh, many of which in the case of Japan, as elsewhere, have been informed by a mixture of productivist and neoliberal ideologies. Um, and of course, by extension, the solution of robots or technology to fill in care gaps is by no means inevitable. Uh, so in this sense, it's not simply a crisis of care, but a crisis of the way that neoliberal capitalism functions. <clears throat> so we start to see here the outline of what Nancy Fraser describes as the contradiction of capitalism, or the idea that capitalism, quote, tends to destabilize the very processes of social reproduction on which it relies, end quote. 
crises of care occur as the tacit economic need for unpaid care labour conflicts with the competing drive for maximal employment in the formal labour force. Capitalist models that largely ignore care labour therefore start to look increasingly precarious when reproduction rates fall and a relatively large section of the population passes retirement age, as in the case of Japan. But at the same time, when in trying to reconcile the conflict, you try to move this huge field of neglected informal care labour that you'd been taking for, taking for granted into the formal economy, it becomes extremely expensive. And I mean, the, you know, a uh, couple of, you know, two million care workers shown on this chart is really the tip of the iceberg uh, because they're still far outnumbered by informal carers. In many sense, in some sense, care robots are presented as the solution, not just to care crises, but also to this wider contradiction of capitalism. Um, they represent an entirely commodified digital and mechanical re uh, replacement for large swathes of human care that can act as a bridge between productive and reproductive labour, turning elder care into a productive enterprise, or as Nolan and Amanda Sharkey have put it, creating a, quote, elder care factory. End quote. Um, and I, I use the word replacement as in replacing human care deliberately. Um, and this is a really important inference that tends to be implicitly drawn from these charts by people who use them to promote or explain the need for care robots, although they often explicitly deny it. Um, but it seems like an obvious conclusion to draw from the expectation that robots will solve the care worker shortage, because how could you solve the care worker shortage without replacing the need for human care workers? Um, some people uh, argue that uh, robots are intended to supplement and never replace caregivers. For example, uh, saying that robots don't do jobs, they do tasks. But I find this a slightly disingenuous argument when jobs are increasingly thought of primarily in a Taylorist frame as a conglomeration of discrete tasks, as they are in robotics research, precisely in order to build the business case for robots. What that entails is that by doing enough tasks, robots will also do jobs, um, although whether this is actually desirable or indeed possible in the case of care is a question I'll return to. Um, during my fieldwork uh, with robot engineers at ICE, um, I observed how this breaking down of the work of care into individual discrete tasks formed an inherent basis of, on the one hand, the development of the robots themselves, and on the other, uh, the creation of a business case for implementing them. Um, the development of care robots relied on what I call a perspective of algorithmic care. In other words, uh, viewing care algorithmically as a linear sequence of simple, repeatable, and discrete physical and verbal tasks that could be digitally and mechanically reproduced by robots. And in this flattened view of care um, as largely logistical, care workers and care recipients tend to be reduced to two-dimensional characters. Um, the people who say that robots do tasks and they don't do jobs often also say that robots can free care workers from dull, repetitive and dangerous physical tasks and focus on the more human tasks like social interaction and companionship. Uh, but on the one hand, uh, social robots are being developed and implemented precisely in order to uh, provide social interaction and companionship. And on the other, the economic rationale for these robots is centered on reducing the overall cost of care. So as scholars like uh, Robert and Linda Sparrow and Jennifer Parks have noted, it's very unlikely that care staff would continue to be paid simply to provide social interactions, especially when these interactions are often the very first thing to be sacrificed in current care practice uh, in many busy care homes or in home care. Uh, you know, why would we expect this to be any different in the future if care homes are spending their shrinking budgets on expensive care robots? Um, we also find some scholars, particularly from philosophy, science and technology studies and computer science, who attempt to provide philosophical underpinnings for the potential robotic replacement of human caregivers. 
So, for example, uh, Darian Meacham and Matthew Studley uh, draw on an inactivist phenomenological approach to argue that users' perceptions of the care that they receive are the only things uh, that really matters, and that care isn't dependent on a caring attitude or an inner state on the part of the caregiver, but just on how well a caregiving agent provides the appearance and the behaviours or the words associated with empathy and a caring attitude and helps uh, produce a caring environment. Um, and they, ver they therefore argue that it's equally morally acceptable for robots to provide care as for humans to do so. Uh, but what these theoretical positions don't tend to take into account are the social and material realities, practices, affordances, political economy or environmental impacts of care robots as they exist today, as they're likely to exist in the near future. Um, and they also don't really engage uh, closely with the lived experiences of those being cared for and those doing the work of care. And I think that that's um, very much part of the unique contribution that anthropological research can make. And that's what I'll turn to now. So after spending some time uh, with the robotics team at IST, um, I conducted field work at a publicly funded nursing care home. Um, it's uh, in Japanese, it's a Tokubetsu Yogo Rojin Homa which is the most common type of residential elder care facility in Japan. Um, and uh, I give it the name Sakura um, in Kanagawa Prefecture. Um, and they were introducing three different types of care robots in 2017 on a trial basis. So I spent about seven months there um, before, during and after the implementation of these robots um, to talk to staff and residents uh, and observe what care looked like before the introduction of the robots and how it changed um, when they were brought in. And uh, together with the um, manager of Sakura, we decided on three different types of off-the-shelf commercially available care robots that were in some way connected or involved in um, ICE robot care projects, so bringing together the two halves of the um, ethnographic research. So the three robots that were brought in were um, the Hug lifting robot, um, Paro, uh, a robotic seal, um, and Peppa, a humanoid robot that was used for recreational exercise. So each robot was borrowed for a trial period of about six weeks and subsequently returned to the companies that had lent them out. Uh, and during this time, um, I also carried out surveys and semi-structured interviews with almost all of the care staff. Um, and again, um, Sakura was um, fairly typical um, as a facility of its type in Japan in terms of its size with about 37 care workers and about 80 residents. So how were the robots used? I'm going to run through this fairly quickly. Uh, due to time, um, but I'm happy to go into more detail in Q&A. So firstly, hug. Um, so is the case in Japan still that um, most lifting of residents or, or uh, care recipients is done manually? So care staff at Sakura were the same. Um, they often manually lift residents between bed and wheelchair, wheelchair and toilet and so on. And most of them suffer from back pain as a result, which is the same <laughs> across Japan. Um, it's really endemic. Um, I think some surveys that I've seen, it's, it's like 80% of care workers have some form of back pain. And HUG was intended to avoid the need for this. So um, care workers would position the resident on the machine, as you can see here, um, and then press a button um, to lift them up. They then wheel the machine, the machine's on wheels, so you can wheel the machine around fairly easily to where they wanted the resident to go, and then press another button to put them down again. Um, but in actual use, um, staff stopped using HUG after just a few days, saying that it was cumbersome and time consuming to wheel it from room to room every time it was used, uh, meaning that they had less time to interact with the resident they were lifting. 
Um, and they also said that only a small number of uh, residents could be lifted comfortably using the hug. Um, it also meant that care workers had less physical contact with residents, which they, um, which they said they valued as an important element of, quote, caring with one's own hands, end quote. Um, Paddle, the seal robot, was given to residents to play with and keep them occupied as a robotic form of um, animal therapy and a distraction aid for some people with dementia who made repeated demands of staff throughout the day. Um, as you may know, Paddle can kind of make noises, move its head and wiggle its tail in response to users petting it and talking to it. Um, although the care workers were initially quite happy with Paddle, um, they saw it as a, you know, um, an easy kind of thing to just give residents and keep them entertained. Um, but uh, problems soon started to emerge um, as one resident kept trying to skin Paddle by removing its outer layer of synthetic fur. Um, he found a zip underneath. Um, and another resident was scared of Paddle and a third developed a very close attachment to the robot to the point where she started refusing to eat meals or go to bed without having it beside her. Um, staff ended up having to keep a very close eye on Paddle's interactions with residents, and it didn't seem to reduce the repetitive behavior patterns of those with severe dementia. Uh, and finally, Pepper was used to run recreational uh, exercise sessions that were held every afternoon by one of the care workers on shift. Um, so what would have happened uh, before Pepper came along was that the care worker would stand in front of the, uh, the room and decide on an activity to do with residents, depending on, you know, what the care worker wanted to do, what the residents wanted to do. Um, and that might be a group game, a conversation, uh, watching a film, doing karaoke. Um, but when Pepper was used, uh, there was a very much a set format to uh, these recreational sessions. So uh, the care worker would first spend some time booting up Pepper, um, wheeling it to the front of the room, uh, explaining what it was about to do. Uh, and it would then come to life playing some upbeat music and a pre-recorded presentation and then launch into a series of exercises that residents could follow along to, as you can see in this picture. Um, but care workers quickly realized that in order to get the residents to participate, um, they had to stand next to Pepper. So if they didn't, if Pepper was on its own, um, uh, residents wouldn't really do what Pepper was telling them to do. Um, uh, also because Pepper is quite short and difficult to see if you're sitting further away, uh, and Pepper's voice is very high pitched um, and difficult to hear for some people. And so uh, what happened is that, as in this photo, the care worker would stand next to Pepper, copy its movements and echo what it was saying. Since there was a relatively small set of uh, songs and exercise routines, boredom started to set in after a few weeks and they ended up using Pepper less often. So. You know, this is a very brief summary, but I wanted to uh, focus on just a few findings. So firstly, the use of robots at Sakura didn't save labor. Uh, on the contrary, it actually increased the number of tasks for care workers. Um, the care robots themselves required care. They had to be moved around, maintained, uh, cleaned, booted up and operated, repeatedly explained and kind of facilitated to residents. Um, constantly monitored during their use and then stored away afterwards uh, with care workers having to act as uh, as Kate puts it in one of her papers as uh, machine babysitters and there's a growing body of evidence from other care robot studies that supports the same conclusion um, some of which are shown here secondly uh, the use of robots had the potential to de-skill human care tasks at the home um, for example, uh, whereas previously uh, care workers came up with their own recreational activities and interacted with the residents, um, now they could uh, give them paddle to play with and monitor the interaction from a distance. Um, 
Whereas previously when uh, lifting residents, they'd use the interaction to have a chat and shorten uh, and build their relationship with them. Now they just operate the hug machine and shorten the interaction in order to have time to wheel it back and forth. So in each uh, case with all three robots, um, existing social and communicative tasks tended to be displaced by new tasks that involved more interaction with the robots rather than the residents. Um, and instead of uh, you know, this promise that robots would save time for the staff to do more of the human work of social and emotional care, the robots actually reduce the scope for such interactions. And thirdly, uh, it's important to note that the robots are quite expensive uh, to buy or lease, even with uh, government subsidies. And they would be uh, very expensive if scaled up to the level where they could be used with all of the residents. And ultimately, the manager of uh, Sakura decided that they weren't worth the cost and he didn't buy any of the robots at the end of the trial until now, um, obviously like six years later. Um, but uh, he has bought robots, but the ones that he's bought are robotic vacuum cleaners. So what kind of future would robots, care robots require in order to become a solution to the care crisis uh, in Japan? So uh, these findings suggest that it would involve employing more but less skilled care staff who would be paid as little as possible. Um, they'd likely uh, also require um, much larger and more standardized care facilities to enable economies of scale that can make the costs of robots affordable. As the need to speak Japanese, to possess care training and experience, or to interact with residents could theoretically be significantly reduced, um, less skilled and lower paid care staff could potentially be brought in more easily from abroad. And in fact, um, that vision might already be in the works with the deregulation of migration channels and accelerating consolidation of Japan's residential care industry over the past few years. Um, and it's worth just um, drawing attention to this particular Eggleston et al. reference, which is a US National Bureau of Economic Research study that analyzed economic data on the use of care robots in Japan and found that care robots that adopted ro uh, care homes that adopted robots employed more people than those with no robots. Uh, but this difference was entirely accounted for by non-regular employees. Uh, it also found that robot adoption correlated with lower wages for nurses, and that homes with robots uh, were more likely to have hired foreign care workers and to have active plans to hire more in the future. So in other words, um, introducing commodified and interchangeable practices of robot care is likely over time to help render human care labor similarly more commodified and interchangeable, potentially extending existing forms of inequality and precarity, um, especially in the growing migrant care labor market. And at the same time, it would seem to bring care practices closer to that flattened and rather reductive algorithmic model of care envisaged by engineers. Um, and I just want to quote uh, roboticist and professor of robot ethics, Alan Winfield, talking about the wider application of AI and robots. Quote, um, the reality is that AI is in fact generating a large number of jobs already. That's the good news. The bad news is that they're mostly crap jobs. Um, it's now clear that working uh, as human assistants to robots and AI in the 21st century is dull and both physically and or psychologically dangerous. Um, these humans are required to behave, in fact, as if they're robots. So it could be argued that um, developing care robots is a harmless enough activity that can quite happily proceed um, in parallel with other care reforms. But when the state buys into a vision of robot care, um, promoting techno-imaginaries of care that fail to recognize the real life limitations of robots or the reality of what care actually involves, um, and investing substantial sums of public money in these kind of robots, there's a significant risk of diverting, on the one hand, diverting funding away from better policy options, uh, and also encouraging policymakers to 
defer making difficult choices in the hope that future robots or AI that doesn't exist yet will, um, in the words of one Japanese government document, quote, rescue society, end quote, from the problems of the aging population. Um, as Dan McQuillan notes, this kind of solutionism uh, aims to solve social problems with technology to paper over and avoid having to address societal inequalities at a more fundamental level. And to give an example of this, um, the Japanese government is currently investing about 600 million pounds on a, a flagship uh, moonshot research and development program that has many, you know, sci-fi sounding project objectives, um, including creating cybernetic avatar robots to, quote, overcome limitations of body, brain, space and time, end quote and supposedly enable people to live free from physical disability and restrictions of age by the year 2050. Uh, and of course, I mean, I haven't even uh, touched on the perspective, toxic and exploitative um, processes of resource extraction and dumping of e-waste in the global south, as well as other negative environmental impacts that massively scaling up robotic care across the global north would entail. Um, but thinking about what uh, would potentially be lost in this trajectory of care roboticization also helped surface what care workers at Sakura saw as important in care. Um, in talking about the friction created in this encounter with robot care, staff also talked about um, their own views on what was required for good care. And um, I know that I'm already over the 45 minutes, but um, in the last part of the talk, I just want to highlight one uh, element of good care. So care workers frequently talked about the, the flow, or in Japanese, nagare, of daily life and work at Sakura. Um, this spatial and temporal flow that had its own social caring rhythms of, of busyness and relative calm. So times during the day when staff felt, um, as they put it, chased by time, doing one thing after another. And other times when they had time to chat and build relationships with residents. And care staff often use the word yoyu to describe these latter occasions. So yoyu refers to a surplus capacity. I think in English, the closest word is probably bandwidth. So the idea of um, having an abundance of time and space, but also extending to a nuance of kind of emotional bandwidth. Um, and care workers often said that your you was, uh, was a vital prerequisite of good care. So as one care worker put it, quote, uh, the way of doing care here at Sakura is according to time. There's a bunch of set things to do and only a set number of staff. So you're busy with the feeling of how many minutes and how many seconds you have. At a place that she'd worked previously, there were only nine residents. So we had your you. We could uh, spend time individually talking with them, um, drinking tea together and so on. Uh, so being able to care while doing that, those things, that's a big difference. Another member of staff said, quote, if you're like, you know, next after you do this, you've got to do that. And then after that, you've got to do this. Then, of course, you absolutely can't respond to users' requests. After all, if there aren't enough staff, you can't, can't have care with your you. And a third care worker explained how uh, good care is relaxed or yutori, uh, relaxed care for both staff and residents. Um, if the staff are too busy, it's difficult for the residents to make requests of them. Um, if uh, we have more staff during busy times, then the staff can do things a bit slower, calm down and can be kind to residents who ask for something. So your you was a capacity or a resource that went beyond the functional minimum requirements of bodily care. It was the capacity not to be chased by time to do one thing after another but to be able to communicate with residents as individuals, accumulating social interactions over time and developing relationships with residents that staff often described as being like family. So essentially building kinship with the people that they were spending their days with and to whom they were providing intimate care 
via repeated and reciprocal social interactions. Um, and that extended to all of the kind of so-called functional care tasks that they did um, that sometimes weren't really seen as being communicative tasks. Um, this individual time spent together in turn uh, provided much of the job satisfaction and the motivation for care staff. Um, this repeated accumulation of social interactions and building of social relationships over time via communicative work and emotional labor done by care workers throughout the day, didn't, it wasn't really accounted for as being care work um, under the algorithmic care model of engineers at IAST, uh, which neatly separated out discrete individual functional and social interactions. Um, but it was seen as being essential to good care by staff. Uh, the care workers' evaluation of these three robots that were brought in seemed to depend in large part on how their use affected this surplus capacity to provide good care. When robots were perceived as reducing your you, uh, you know, removing opportunities for leisurely communication or distancing you know, care staff from residents, um, then workers tended to express negative reactions to the robots and stop using them. Your you seemed to present uh, an ethic of care that was unbounded by and resistant to the institutionalism of the care home, as well as resistant to uh, the productivist ideology of wider Japanese capitalism, um, which to some extent was being kind of imported into Sakura via these three care robots and their associated uh, operating processes. And I think your you, this concept of your you suggests a way to move um, towards more humanistic, caring rhythms that emphasize facilitating social interactions and developing social ties, making care easier for caregivers and care recipients by providing additional time to cultivate personal care. And this solution to the crisis of care is, you know, in some ways the most straightforward uh, and intuitive, but but also the hardest to accomplish under conditions of neoliberal capitalism, uh, to acknowledge the skilled relational work involved in good care, make care a valued profession, encourage more caregivers into the section, sector, um, resist the imposition of uh, an industrialized temporality based on a logic of productivism and commodification uh, that we see expressed in algorithmic care and embodied in care robots. Um, and also to support and make financially and emotionally sustainable the formation of meaningful social relationships between those giving and receiving care, uh, developing rather than uh, discarding what Shannon Valor calls the moral skills of care. And this suggests uh, an entirely different approach to care policy uh, than trying to develop robots to replace caregivers and reduce costs. In terms of technological innovation, uh, instead of viewing the resistance of caregivers and care recipients as problems of culture or change management to be ignored or overridden, um, I think it may be more helpful to go back to the drawing board and start again from different grounding points. Um, firstly, thinking in terms of the socio-technical instead of just uh, the technological, um, which may seem obvious, but it's still routinely neglected in robot development and human-robot interaction studies. Secondly, uh, striving to gain local understandings of caring and care work as contextual and relational practices, rather than starting from universalizing assumptions and primarily uh, quantitative analysis. Um, and actually, Amy van Weinsberg uh, has proposed um, uh, a model of care-centered, value-sensitive design for care robots and care technologies that focuses on relationality. And by doing so, more values such as your you that may be important to the work of care and should be taken into account when designing new systems may be discovered. Um, and just to give some recent uh, further examples from uh, Japan, anthropologists Jason Danley and Isaac Kavegia um, have focused on things like questioning the boundaries between formal and informal care, um, fostering creativity and conviviality for well-being and how independence in older age is made possible through a network of multiple social interdependencies. 
Um, and thirdly, centering care recipients and care workers and eliciting their active and meaningful uh, participation across the whole life cycle of any new technologically enabled care process, um, including you know, research, design, development, and ongoing use, maintenance, and disposal of care technologies. So I'll leave it there, and um, I'm happy to take any questions or comments that anyone might have on my references.